reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This evening, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Judges, chapter 13. We're going to look at Judges 13 through 16, Samson. We're going to look at the life of Samson, his birth in chapter 13, uh, his Philistine wife in chapter 14, his victories in chapter 15, and his sad end in chapter 16. Samson is definitely one of the most interesting characters in the Bible. Uh, There have been several movies uh, done on him, a rather interesting and romantic figure. Uh, I was noticing in, uh, once in a while I check to see how our videos are being viewed on YouTube, and I haven't really done much of a study of late, but uh, the ones that I did five years ago, and I go through the Bible in a five-year cycle, uh, I did this five years ago, I, I checked the uh, general usage over five years. It might be several hundred uh, views on a particular lesson. But with Samson, much to my surprise, there was over 13,000 views on this particular uh, subject. Uh, not a testimony to my teaching, but a testimony to the fact that he is very interesting And for that sake, we want to make sure that we're hearing from God, not from us, because a lot of people hopefully will watch this again over the next five years. So let's ask for God's help, shall we? Father, we're so grateful to study your word, no matter what the subject. Help us to really understand what you want to say to us and then through us to others. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the period of Judges, uh, following Moses, bringing the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years, and uh, Joshua taking them through the promised land and conquering much of that area. Now it's a time of restlessness and lawlessness, and the theme of Judges is whatever was right in their own eyes, they did. And that's the essence of sin, doing what's right in your eyes, not what's right in God's eyes. So the pattern has been established in Judges, a pattern really of human nature. We sin, uh, we then get punished by God for it, we're in bondage, we ask forgiveness, he uh, then sends a deliverer, and we then have peace, and then we go back and sin again, the cycle goes on and on. In the case of Israel, when they were in bondage to their enemies at the hand of God, they then called on God for deliverance, he would send a judge. And a judge in those days was somebody who would decide cases according to the law of God, but also who would be the military leader and take them into victory over their enemies. Kind of like the president, the Congress, the judiciary, all rolled in one. Well, here's a period now where God's going to raise up a man named Samson, who's going to be a very powerful man physically, and he's going to be sporadic in terms of his spiritual nature, kind of an on-again, off-again person, much like we are if we're honest with ourselves at times. So let's begin with chapter 13 of the book of Judges as we look at Samson's birth. He's born to godly parents. They fear God, they pray, and they believe in God. And then God promises them a very special child. We'll see that in verses 1 to 23, that God has a very special child in mind for them, and he's going to fulfill the promise that God has for him in verses 24 and 25. Now, Samson's going to become a Nazarite. Uh, That means a separated one. And uh, there were Nazarite vows, such as the Apostle Paul took, where you would vow to God a life of separation and holiness, and you would then assume the Nazarite vow, which was basically three things. Number one, you would not partake of anything from the vine. You couldn't have any wine, couldn't have any grapes, couldn't have any grape juice. Number one, no wine, no vine. Number two, you don't cut your hair for the time of that vow. You do not cut your hair for that vow. Number three, you don't touch any dead bodies. 
even your family. You don't touch a dead body. You show separation and holiness to God. And uh, this man, Samson, is going to have a vow of Nazarite vow, not just for a period of time, as the Apostle Paul did, but for his whole life. And that becomes a central theme here about his not obeying that vow. His strength is going to come from his obedience, and his weakness will come from his disobedience. My strength comes from my obedience, and so does yours. Our weakness comes from our disobedience. The lesson, I think, for this chapter might well be, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, says the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't touch what's unclean, and I will receive you. So let's begin now with chapter 13 and verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, the Philistines were a heathen group that lived by the Mediterranean Sea, and they were a constant source of problems for the uh, Israelites. And uh, these are the people now who are dominating Israel. They are controlling Israel. Israel is not free to do what it wants. So there's a certain man, verse 2, from Zorah of the family of the Danites. In other words, from the tribe of Dan. His name was Manoah. His wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord, whenever you see capital A, angel of the Lord, that is none other than Jesus Christ. And here he is hundreds and hundreds of years before he's going to be born in Bethlehem. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So we find here this man named Manoah. His wife is barren, and the Lord Jesus comes and speaks to the woman and tells her about the mission that she has. He comes to her because she will have to be in charge of this child from the womb and make sure this child is obeying the Nazarite vow not to drink anything uh, from the vine and uh, not to eat anything unclean, and not to cut his hair, and to bear this Nazarite vow right from the womb. And he has a great calling on his life. He is going to begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Notice the word begin. It will not be a complete work of victory, but it will be a beginning. So the woman came and told her husband. Isn't that interesting? She came and told the husband what the angel said. I wish that Eve had gone to Adam and said, Satan wants me to take this fruit, dear. What do you think? Had she gone to him, we don't know if he would have yielded the way she did or not, but it's important for a woman to go to the husband and indicate what she's, being, uh, what, what she's about, what she's hearing from the Lord. It's important for the husband to go to the wife and share as well. For them to be one flesh, they should be one spiritually as well as physically and emotionally. So she's doing the right thing. She's going to the husband in verse 6, and she says, A man of God, she doesn't know it's the Lord himself, but a man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. So she recognizes this is no ordinary man. Uh, and it's an awesome presence uh, we know of God himself. So he, that angel, said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or a similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. It's going to be a lifelong vow of separation for God. Awesome commission. 
Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. Notice the godliness of the parents. The mother is open to the angel of the Lord, receptive, willing to be used as a vessel, even as Mary, years later, will be yielded to bear this very angel of the Lord, Jesus himself. And the father is godly, and he's asking God to give us direction now as to how to raise this child. And this should be the prayer of our lives as well. When you have children and grandchildren, Lord, reveal how you want this child raised, what the calling is for this child, how should we teach and uh, educate this child in the ways of the Lord. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, verse 9, and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So again, he wasn't around, and the angel appeared to the woman alone. So the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So she's being obedient again and going to her husband to be included. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? Good questions. Good questions for parents to ask about their children today. What is going to be the child's rule of life? And what is going to be his work? Maybe you've got a child who is not quite focused on what his or her calling is. Maybe kind of floating around, just uh, going nowhere. Lord, reveal to me and reveal to my child or my grandchild the rule of life for that child and what that child's work is to be. We're all created for a certain purpose, not to just sit around and play Xbox all day, not to sit and watch cartoons or just fool around and, and vape and smoke and drink and do drugs. There's got to be a rule of life and a work. Lord, what is this child's purpose? Reveal it and help us to bring it to pass by your grace. So Manoah said, let your words come to pass. What's the boy's rule of life and his work? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. So always pay attention to what I said. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or a similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, all that I commanded her, let her observe. We don't know why God had said not to have anything from the vine, except that the basic use of the vine then was not grape juice, nor was it eating grapes. It was basically what? It was wine. And so the priests were not allowed to drink wine when they ministered to the Lord in the tabernacle and later on the temple. My guess is that this Nazarite vow meant you're not to drink at all. And uh, back in the New Testament, we find in 1 Timothy 3 that one of the qualities of an elder is to not be given to wine or to much wine. And so wine can uh, cloud our thinking, can lead to drunkenness if we're not careful. And so to be abstinent from wine is a good, healthy thing, to have a clear mind unto God. So she needs to be observing that. So Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, verse 15, Please let us detain you, and we will prepare a young goat for you. So in typical hospitality at that time, even as Abraham was showing hospitality to the same angel of the Lord, plus two angels, let me prepare something for you to eat, that was common. They didn't have any restaurants in those days, any fast food places, so you had to prepare food for your traveler. I think Manoah at this point thinks this is a man, a very special man, from God no doubt, but as a man he's entitled to a decent meal. And so he's going to prepare this goat for him to enjoy as food. But the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. So Jesus now is saying to him, No, I'm not going to accept it as food. But I'll accept it as a burnt offering, indicating worship unto God. So we're converting this not just as a meal, it's going to be a burnt offering, a sacrifice, which is going to be a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus himself who will become our burnt sacrifice, if you will. The burnt sacrifice had to be totally burned up overnight on the altar until there was nothing left the next day. It was a picture of the complete 
giving of his life of the Lord Jesus later on. He on the cross becomes metaphorically our burnt offering. So I'll receive this burnt offering as you acknowledge me as the deliverer, as the savior yet to come. So Manoah yet didn't know he was the angel of the Lord. He just thought he was a man at this point. So Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Interesting name. My name is wonderful. Isaiah is going to talk about the fact that Jesus, among others, uh, as the Messiah, is the wonderful counselor. Talks about the wonderful, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name is wonderful, the wonderful counselor. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. So the Lord simply disappears in that flame, becoming in one with that sacrifice, if you will, a very clear picture of the fact that this is the be- a showing of what's going to happen with Jesus later on, giving his life for us and ascending into heaven. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame, they fell to the ground, and then verse 21, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. So now they recognize truly that this is a messenger from God, actually God himself. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. So she's got a clear head about it and say, no, he's not going to kill us. He's showing us who he is and what he wants to do. So the woman bore a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtol. So he was up there in that northern area uh, of the camp of Dan, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move on him. Remember now, this is the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit does not indwell. The Holy Spirit comes upon somebody for a season and then leaves when that commission is done or that person has sinned and driven the Spirit away. We'll see the Holy Spirit working upon him, coming upon him very mightily. We'll also see then times of his moving in the flesh, much as we move in the Spirit and sometimes move in the flesh, don't we? Chapter 14, now we're going to begin to see Samson as he is an interesting picture uh, we look at Samson, we, we see his sins, and we see his obedience, we see his downfall, we see his victories, but it's interesting that even when he does wrong, God is not condoning his wrongdoing, but God is working in and through it in spite of it. And that's important for us to realize. We can't simply write somebody off and say, that person's no good, that person's going to hell, um, that person does wrong, but God can still work even in the midst of those bad situations to do good things. So it's more complicated than we think. It means basically, let's get out of the judging business. It's not our place. It's for God to judge, and he will do that in time. But let's see now what's going to be happening to Samson. He's a very interesting fellow. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. So here he is talking to his parents. We begin to see automatically that he's going to a heathen. He wants to marry an unbeliever. Israel has been told already through Moses, you're not to associate with or marry the heathens, the unbelievers. 
You're to stay within your own family and your own people. Paul says the same thing to us in 2 Corinthians 6. We are not to uh, marry unbelievers. We're not to uh, associate with them in a close way. We can work with them, of course, but uh, we're not to align ourselves with unbelievers because Satan has nothing to do with Christ and light with dark, etc. But he is going to uh, want to marry a Philistine, and he's not asking his parents what their counsel is. He's telling them what they're going to do. So we're beginning to see a little bit of his character here. He's very strong, and he's not one for taking advice from other people. I'm beginning to think if he was on a psychiatrist's couch, they'd begin to think he has ODD. You know what that ODD is? Oppositional Defiant Disorder. My mom didn't know about that. She called it plain disobedience, and she had the strap to take care of it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so uh, he's, uh, this is what I want you to do. She's my, uh, you, you go ahead and get her for me. Then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people? It was a whole of Israel that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines. And Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. So again, more insight into him. His father is not really having authority over him, nor his mother. He's calling the shots in his life. I'm not sure how old he is here, but he certainly is uh, saying, this is what I want. And he was, we're seeing what is driving his sensibility. Not God, not the nation. She pleases me well. I want to do it. I want to do it my way. It feels good. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was speaking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So it becomes a little more complicated for me because I'm saying, Samson, you should not go and marry a Philistine. And that's God's law. And that's God's word. And yet God is in this because he wants an occasion to use Samson to bring the Philistines down. So as we're judging other people, we need to say, Lord, it's a little too much for me to figure this out. You take care of it. There's so-and-so over there marrying an unbeliever. That's wrong. It's going to be a ruinous situation. Well, it is against God's counsel. But God sometimes can have a plan that we don't even know about that he's going to work good even through that situation as well. So best for us to pray and say, thy will be done. So Philistines have dominion over Israel. Verse 5, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. So here suddenly he's got a young lion, strong and mighty, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So now we get some insight into the fact that not only is he called by God, has a Nazarite vow upon him, but he's unusually physically strong. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. That's important to Samson. Of course, we like to be pleased as well, don't we? He liked her. And after some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. So here is the dead lion, and all the flesh has been eaten away by animals, and the bees have taken up a nice residence there, and there's honey in there. So now he's going to violate the Nazarite vow. He's going to touch a dead body. It's symbolic of touching what is unclean. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. So now he's partaking of something unclean. In the, uh, I went to a, a restaurant or to a, a grocery store the other day, and it said we serve kosher and non-kosher food. Kosher has to do with being clean as far as the Jews are concerned. And they will not eat uh, non-kosher food. And so uh, this, in a sense, is, is non-kosher. It's unclean. And he's going ahead and he's eating it. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some of that to them. And they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So, as is often the case, when you and I do something wrong and we get others involved with it, that uncleanness passes to them. And so this unclean act of eating the honey out of the dead lion has now been passed on to his parents 
and inadvertently they are partaking of that which is unclean as well. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for young men used to do so. So the father doesn't know that the honey was unclean. He's going to go ahead and get ready for the wedding now. He makes the proposal on behalf of his son, and uh, the son's going to invite some young fellows uh, for a bachelor's party. It happened when they saw him that they brought, they brought 30 companions to be with him. So they've got 30 companions of his now. He doesn't even know them probably. And Samson said to them, let me pose a riddle to you. So he's kind of a, I think Samson's a bit of a party guy. I think if we knew him today, uh, he's not the kind of fellow who'd be sitting in the temple reading the scriptures all the time. He's kind of a hail fellow, well met, uh, down at the local pub having a good time. Um, in any event, he says, let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. So he's going to have some fun with these guys. And uh, the, the feast would last seven days, typically in those days. And uh, so you've got seven days to solve this riddle. And if you can't solve it, then uh, uh, I want you to, I want, I want seven, 30, it, it, it says, I'm sorry, let me go back. It, it, if you solve it, if you can solve it correctly, then I'll give you 30 uh, linen garments and 30 changes of silver, uh, of, of clothing rather. If you cannot explain it to me, then you'll give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. So they had a nice little contest going on. So they said to him, pose your riddle, that we may hear it. So here's the riddle. He said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. So that they gotta think about that now. They got seven days to think about it. If they can't figure it out, they owe him 30 uh, linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And uh, if, if they can solve it, then he owes it to them. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now for three days, they could not explain the riddle. Couldn't figure it out. He's having fun with all this, I'm sure. Came to pass on the seventh day, they said to Samuel's wife, entice your husband, that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? So you've invited us to this party. You're going to take our clothing like that? Find out about the riddle, or we're burning you and your pop down. Then Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And he said to her, look, I have not explained it to my father or my mother, so should I explain it to you? Now she had wept on him the seven days while the feast lasted, and it happened on the seventh day that he told her, because she pressed him so much, then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. So we're beginning to see a weakness in his character here. We've already seen it about the lion, about wanting to marry an unbeliever, and uh, we find that he's susceptible now to a woman just uh, nagging him over and over and over again. And he's not the first man to be uh, faced with that situation for sure. And uh, so she's continuing to nag him and finally he gives in and explains it to her. And then she explains it to the sons of the people, these 30 men. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion. And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. So he is angry now because that's the answer to the riddle. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. He went down to Ashkelon, killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, gave the changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused. He went back up to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So here we find a fleshly move on his part. He's angry and he goes out and he kills 30 other Philistines <clears throat> and gets their clothing and gives it to these 30 uh, guys who came to his wedding. And it's a purely fleshly act and yet the Spirit of the Lord is upon him because God is looking for an occasion to defeat 
the Philistines and their stronghold on Israel. So as you and I sit back and judge Samson and say, that was wrong and anger to go out and kill 30 innocent men, we have to realize that even there, God was in it somehow. So this becomes more complicated than for us to simply make judgments about people and their actions. Again, pray for them. Lord, your wisdom. And so um, Samson's wife is now given to the best man, and that's the end of that deal. Chapter 15 now. Here we're going to see him uh, with some victories. And this gets very, very interesting. Um, After a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. So I guess he felt the desire to have friendship and kinship. So he goes down with a young goat to find her. It's been a while, but now is the time to go visit her. And so he said, let me go into my wife, into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in because she was married to somebody else. Her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. See, that anger starts to rise up within him again. And Samson went and caught, this is interesting, he caught 300 foxes and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of their tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain as well as the vineyards and olive groves. Can you imagine that? So he's so angry that uh, the wife has been given to someone else, the best man, that he is going to do damage to the Philistines. So it's his anger, which is definitely uh, taking over again, but God is in it. And uh, you think about foxes. I I was teaching this five years ago, and I was listening to my, my teaching the other day just to get refreshed on it. And a few days before the teaching, five years ago, I was walking my dogs in the woods, as I do every day, and lo and behold, a red fox ran across the trail in front of us, just a matter of a few yards, so fast. And I had two German shepherds and two terriers. They didn't even notice. So you talk about moving fast. That's how fast this fox was moving. They couldn't even identify what was going on. This guy goes out and finds 300 foxes, ties their tails together, two to two, puts a torch between them, sets the torches on fire, lets them loose, and they go through and burn up the whole countryside. Well, the Philistines are angry. (laughs) Verse 6, they said, who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So that was the end of that. It's kind of a tit-for-tat situation, right? You, you hit me, I'll hit you harder. Samson said to them, and he's, he's going to go tit for tat, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will see. So I'm going back on you again now. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Etam. So as we look at what's going on here, we see a man who is very strong, very impulsive, Uh, given to his emotions quickly, and doing things out of spite and anger and fleshly desires and ambitions, and yet God is using him. So before I judge somebody else, I need to realize, Lord, I don't know the whole scene. I don't know what you're trying to do with this person. I'm not in the position of judge. I'm here to pray for that individual. And then for myself, There are times that I do things of God, and there are times I do things of the flesh. And so I think, well, I'm no good. I'll never be used by God. I'll lose my salvation. I'll this or that. No, God is going to use us. He's not approving of our fleshly deeds. He's not approving of our sins, but he's still working with us, kind of like a parent with a child. It's amazing how parents will correct will discipline, will do all they can with a child, but when the child messes up, that child is still their child. They're still going to work with them. They're still going to love them. He may be in jail. She may be in jail, but they're still going to visit. They're going to still hope for that child to come out and live a good life. Parents, ideally, don't give up on their children, and God doesn't give up on us. 
And so here he's not only not giving up on Samson, he's actually using him because the main purpose of this man for his life is to begin to bring down the stronghold of the Philistines on Israel. Well, now the Philistines are sure angry with him, verse 9. Now the Philistines went up and encamped in Judah, and they deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. You see, the, one of the problems with Samson's leadership is he's not really leading anybody, is he? He's not really leading the nation. He's a one-man situation. When you've got a person who's not leading a nation or a, a, a contingency, but he's just a one-person or she's a one-person operation, that's a, that's a bit difficult. And he's not really leading his nation the way Jephthah did and, and Gideon and some of the others. He's just doing this all himself. He's, he's a one-man show. Reminds me of these, some of these basketball teams. You get a basketball team that has a super, super, superstar. And four also rants. And that superstar is the whole deal. And those teams are not usually very successful. It's the ones that learn to work as a team with less gifted people coordinating. And then they come as a unified front. That team will win every time. Well, we come up against Samson. We have no beef with you, Judah, but we want him. So verse 11. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam to talk to Samson. 3,000 fellow Israelites. He's from the tribe of Dan. They're from the tribe of Judah. They went down to talk to him. Show you how formidable he was. 3,000 people to talk to one man. Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. (laughs) So... Samson, the Philistines are over us. Why are you provoking them? And he's got these very simple answers here. As they did to me, so I have done to them. He is just a man who works by the flesh. He punches and counter punches. So they said to him, we have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. So we have to arrest you or they're going to come against us. So Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. So he agrees to be uh, tied up by them and delivered into the hands of Judah. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Oh, they were excited. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. So you see, the Spirit of God is upon him, and uh, now he's going to do some real damage. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Talk about power. Talk about strength. Just a jawbone. Uh, and of this poor, this old donkey that died, and uh, suddenly he's uh, victorious over a thousand of those uh, Philistines. And he's a bit of a poet as well. So Samson said, verse 16, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. I have slain a thousand men. I have slain a thousand men. Nothing about God. Nothing about the Lord there. Samson is pretty much uh, his own man, isn't he? And yet, God is using him. And so it was, when he had finished speaking, that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi, which translated means jawbone height. Then he became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. Now he's acknowledging it. And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. So he's a bit dramatic, isn't he? Remember Esau came in from hunting and Jacob had this nice lentil stew. I'm going to die. Give me some stew or I'm going to die. I'm going to die of thirst. A little melodramatic. We get like that, don't we? We have a very down and depressed day. Lord, take me. I can't stand living any longer. Life is not worth living. And so he gets that real melodramatic action here. And uh, so he says, well, I'd be falling into the hands of the uncircumcised. 
So God, verse 19, split the hollow place that is in Lehi and water came out and he drank. So God supernaturally has water come out uh, from this place, this rock. His spirit returned, he revived, and so now he calls its name on Hakor, which is, Le- which is in the Lehi to this day. And that word, on uh, Hakor, uh, means the spring of the caller. Um, he names it after himself. <laughs> I'm the caller. I called it forth. I think he's talking about himself there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob named wells after God. He's talking about the fact that he calls forth that water. He's naming it after himself. So he's got an interesting relationship with God. He acknowledges God. He, he submits to the spirit of God. But he's also very much about himself in the flesh. He judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. So he had a good reign, a good uh, rule. Now the very famous story we all know about uh, and was captured in film and, and elsewhere. Chapter 16 about Samson and Delilah. Now Samson went to Gaza. It's way down by the Mediterranean where the Philistines are. And he saw a harlot there and he went into her. Uh, that's, that, that, this is a harlot. This is not Delilah. Uh, people try to get confused with these uh, situations or are confused and they see, they see Delilah as a harlot. She was not the harlot. She comes up next. But this is a harlot. She's a prostitute. And so uh, he, just, he wants a little fun, wants a little action. And so he goes down there and goes into her. And the Gazites were told that Samson has come here. Well, they were excited about that. They surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They are going to kill him. They were quiet all night saying, in the morning when it's daylight, we're going to kill him. Well, Samson laid low until midnight. And then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gates of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carry them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. I find him fascinating. What, what, what is the purpose of that? He just felt like doing it. He could have walked out the door, but he just lifts up the whole gate, the post and everything, carries it on his shoulders, way up at the top of the hill. Think about the poor slobs that are going to go up there and kind of drag this thing down again and put it back in place. He's, just, he's a very weird fellow. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Ah, here she is. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. That was very enticing. What is the secret to his incredible strength? is incredible power. That's her commission. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So he's got a sense of humor. He's a very, very interesting character. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried. She bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, uh, staying with, with her in the room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn, breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of this strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, that I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. So she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. See how she keeps working on him and he keeps resisting her but it's getting closer and closer. First it was the bowstrings and then the ropes 
and now it's my hair. He's getting very close to the truth. And this is how, how the devil keeps working on you and getting you to yield and you resist and you resist and then finally you're getting to the point where you can't resist. So then she said to him, verse 15, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. Remember his wife that he first married from Timnah and how she kept working on him and finally he gave in and told the riddle to her and she told it to the companions. And so he had that weakness, didn't he? That was a weakness in him that he just kept yielding. Uh, he just couldn't finally uh, say no. So it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, he told her all his heart and he said to her, and here's the truth, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called to the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her, brought the money in their hand, she lulled him to sleep on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head, seven meaning the number of completion of God's power. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him saddest words in the Bible. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters. He became a grinder in the prison. And so here is a picture of sin and how it can take us down. And I've used it as a lesson in chapter 16. This verse 21 shows us the blinding the binding and the grinding results of sin. It blinds us, it binds us, and it grinds us. And that's where he is at this point. Here's a very sad picture of the fact that it wasn't the hair that was his strength. It was the obedience, the vow of obedience and of separation. And so he disobeyed God. He disobeyed him by having that hair cut and now that strength had left him. And so here's a pitiful picture of a person who had power with God like few. And yet because of his sin, the power of the Lord had left him. Isaiah says that, your sin, that God's arms are not short, that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy, that it cannot hear. But your sins have separated you from your God. And so here, here he is, and he is in the, the, uh, in the prison. He's blinded. He's binded, he's bound, and he's grinding. Uh, he's in that prison. He's grinding grain for them, just like a, an ox or, or an animal or a donkey. Well, the good news is, if 21 shows us blinding, binding, and grinding, verse 22, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. There's your mercy. There's your grace. You're never beyond the grace of God. You may have sinned, and if you're watching by television or YouTube, or if you're here, we've all sinned. We've all come short of God's glory. We think that God gives up on us, but he never, ever gives up on us. It's that mother with her son in prison. She never gives up on him, keeps praying for him. And so God will always extend his mercy. If we'll confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we also have to repent we have to change and not do that which brought us into sin. Well, verse 23, The lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. You see how our sin causes the unbeliever to think that, that, that their way is right instead of ours? It gives God a black eye, doesn't it? It gives God a, a bad name. When the people saw him, they praised their God, but they didn't praise his God because what he did was not praising God and not praiseworthy of God. 
Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened, when their hearts were merry, that they said, call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So now he's going to be denigrated to just a, like a circus animal, just to come on in and offer entertainment. So they called for Samson from the prison. He performed for them, and they uh, stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the Lord, who held him, to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars. He couldn't even see where he was going, how sad it was. And so it is when our strength has departed, we can't even see. But his hair had regrown, and so God's grace is there. He says, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray, strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. So he's got the right idea. He's being used by God to destroy the Philistines, but he still doesn't have that vision. I'm a leader of Israel. He doesn't see beyond himself. It's about my eyes. That's all he can see is my eyes. We need a greater vision. Lord, help me to get beyond myself, praying for my wife, my kids, and my dogs, and my cats. I want to pray for my nation, my president, my governor, my council people, the world. Let's get a bigger vision than just ourselves. So Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple. He braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. And so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. And so ends the very interesting and in many ways sad story about Samson, a man who could have done more, and yet, if I think I'm better than Samson, will I find my name in Hebrews the way he is there? I don't think so. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about the great men and women of faith, and who is there but our beloved Samson. And uh, it tells us here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, talking about the hall of fame of the great people of faith. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And so he's there with the great men and women of faith. So we can't look down upon Samson and say he was a failure. Yes, he had fleshly passions, but who was greater than the Apostle Paul who wrote in chapter 7 of Romans, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There'll be other people who will pray Samson is going to be followed later on by Samuel. And Samuel is going to pray a prayer uh, against the Philistines to overcome them. I've given that to you in your outline, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9. And he'll accomplish more in that prayer than the lifetime of Samson, just by prayer alone. But I think for us to walk away from the situation with Samson, we have several conclusions. He was a mighty man of God, chosen by God. He moved as God moved upon him. Yes, he also indulged in fleshly passions and uh, was disobedient at times, but uh, God still used him. And even at the end, sad as it was, even though he was blinded and bound and grinding, one more time, God used him for the glory of God. So I realize there's hope for me because I fail and you fail, we all do. 
But God loves us. He's called us. He'll use us. And don't be surprised when you get up to heaven and you walk down that hall of fame of the greats of God. The ones of chapter 11 of Hebrews there, but I think your picture's going to be on the wall as well. Make sure that it's on the wall by coming to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful study uh, that God gives us in the portion of Scripture, Judges 13 to 16. We pray that many folks are going to watch this as they have other videos and ours on Samson before. Father, we realize that the Hall of Fame is based on faith, not actions. Faith in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be in that Hall of Fame by trusting in you as our Lord and Savior. Forgive us for our sins, for our fleshly passions and indulgences. Help us to walk in obedience, the obedience of, that the, the Nazarite vow was for Samson, but you've given us obedience to come out from the unclean and be separate. Help us to do that, Lord. And if we fail, help us to quickly repent and come back to you. And help us not to judge somebody else who might be in the, the, the downturn phase of Samson, the failure phase of Samson. Because you can turn that person around tomorrow, Lord, to do a mighty work for you. Help us not to judge, but to pray for and encourage others in their walk as well. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's all because of you. You are the author and the finisher and completer of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This moment your needs to supply.